to our video on the principles of biostatistics, where we'll learn its application as it relates to epidemiology. First, we'll go through the different types of data that exist. Then, we'll briefly look at the different measures within epidemiology, four specifically that we'll go through. Number one being your measures of frequency. Examples of this include prevalence rates versus incidence rates. Two is your measures of association. Examples of this include your risk ratio versus your odds ratio. Three is your measures of central tendency. These can be defined as your mean, median, and mode values within a given data set. And lastly, we'll go through some additional epi measures such as the attack rate of a specific disease, all of which we'll look at what do these things mean in relation to interpreting our data set. From here, we'll go through and talk about data analysis. Four points we'll cover. Number one being hypothesis generation. We'll go through and define what is a null hypothesis versus an alternate hypothesis. Number two, we'll look at various statistical tests used within epidemiologic research, such as your chi-square versus your ANOVA. Number three, we'll look at the different types of error that can occur within a study, defining its power, as well as looking at various confidence intervals. And number four, we'll go through briefly looking at what does it mean to have bias and confounding within these studies. So first up, we'll go through our data points. There are many different forms of data, each measured distinctly, collected under certain circumstances and used for different statistical analysis techniques. The two most basic types are your quantitative and qualitative data. Qualitative data deals with descriptions and may only be observed, not measured. So examples would include gender, smoking status, such as smoker versus non-smoker, or an opinion that can be either agree, disagree, or neutral. Whereas quantitative data deals with numbers and may be measured on some scale. So examples would include age, weight, or height. Two specific subcategories here are your categorical versus continuous data sets. Categorical is divided into groups that have specified common characteristics or traits. And there are three subtypes here, nominal, dichotomous versus ordinal, whereas continuous data can take any value within a certain range. And there are two subtypes here, interval versus ratio. I've pulled up a table here defining these terms and looking at different examples, whereas your categorical data is referring to a data set where there are two or more possible responses, whereas your continuous data is referring to data that is measured along a continuum. So an example of this is your temperature range. This is where there are no zero values as zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't really mean there is no heat, rather it means it's very cold. This is in contrast to our ratio data where there is a meaningful zero value, meaning zero, there is none of that variable. Again, this is going to exist on a continuum such as blood pressure measures, height and weight, one's pulse rate, things like that. Next up, we're going to look at different measures of frequency within epidemiology. Two examples are your prevalence rates versus your incidence rates. Within prevalence, there are two subtypes. One being point prevalence, which refers to the proportion measured at a certain distinct point in time, whereas your period prevalence refers to the proportion measured over any interval of time. And the formula for this is going to be looking at existing cases of a disease divided by the total number of people in that study population. So for example, in 2019, there were 500 cases of the flu in city X with a population of 1,000 people. How do we calculate the prevalence here? The numerator is going to be our cases of disease, in this case that's 500, and the denominator is going to be the total number of people in that population, in this case it's 1,000. 500 divided by 1,000 times 100 to yield a 50% of that population 
has prevalent cases of the flu. This number is going to help public health experts to then implement interventions within CityX for that population to yield a lower number of cases of the flu for the following year, something like vaccination programs. Next up, we have incidence rates, two subtypes here, one being cumulative incidence. This is referring to new cases or incidence of disease within a given population. Two is incidence density. This slightly differs in that the denominator here is going to involve a time component of the at-risk population. So this is going to be person to time. The formula is going to be new cases as opposed to existing cases for your numerator. The denominator is going to be your total at risk in the population that's similar to prevalence unless we're looking at incidence density where again we have a person to time component. So let's look at an example. In a diabetes follow-up study, 20 women developed diabetes of 80. What is the incidence? In this case, we're referring to the cumulative incidence rate. There is no person to time factor. The numerator is our new cases, that's 20 women. The denominator is our total cases, that's 80. These two divided times 100 will yield a 25% of that given study population developed diabetes. Again, this number will help public health experts develop interventions to lower the risk of diabetes. And now before we go on, let's go through some practice questions to apply what we just learned. If the prevalence of a disease has been more or less constant for the past 10 years, what would be the effect of a treatment that prolongs the life of people suffering from that disease? So to answer this, I'm going to pull up a picture here to visualize what's going on. The question is saying there is now a treatment that prolongs the life of people, meaning they are not dying or leaving that population. So in essence, prevalence is being increased. Number two, if the prevalence of a disease has been more or less constant for the past 10 years, what would be the effect of a new program that reduces the incidence of the disease? So again, I'll pull up that same picture, and the question is saying that there's a new program that's reducing the incidence, so we're not having more people join this population. So if incidence is decreasing, in essence, that prevalence is also decreasing. And lastly, if the prevalence of a disease has been more or less constant for the past 10 years, what would be the effect if a large number of healthy people immigrated into the population? So here, let's look at this in terms of math. If we have five prevalent cases in a population of 10 people, where we still have five prevalent cases, but this time our population is 20 people, 20 healthy individuals that have migrated. The first set yields 50%, whereas the second set yields 25%. So in essence, our prevalence is also decreasing here. So next up, we're going to go through and briefly define measures of association. We have two examples that we'll go through here, one being your risk ratio, also known as relative risk, and two being your odds ratio. So looking at the risk ratio or relative risk, this is oftentimes used in cohort studies and is the risk of disease in exposed versus unexposed people, whereas your odds ratio is used in case control studies and looks at the odds of exposure in people with the disease versus controls. And I've pulled up a two by two table here. This is also known as a contingency table to kind of look at these different values and where they fall within the table. The columns are going to be your disease status, whereas your rows are going to be your exposure status. And this is very important to keeping things straight for plugging in numbers into your formulas. So looking at the formula for your RR, this is going to be exposed divided by unexposed. Mathematically, this will be represented by your A divided by your A plus B. 
all over your C divided by your C plus D. And the way to interpret this is if your RR equals 1, there is no association between disease and exposure. Whereas your RR is greater than 1, meaning the exposure is associated with increased disease, whereas if it's below 1, it's decreased disease. Moving over to our odds ratio, the OR is represented by cases divided by controls. Again, mathematically, this is represented by A divided by C all over B divided by D. Looking at this mathematically, it's going to yield A times D divided by B times C. And the interpretation here is that if your OR equals 1, again, there's no association between disease and exposure. If your OR is greater than 1, the disease is associated with increased exposure, whereas if it's less than 1, it's a decreased exposure. Pay attention to the wording here. With that said, we'll look at a practice problem. A research project was completed to determine if the use of artificial sweetener was associated with the risk of bladder cancer. 300 patients diagnosed with cancer were identified. 594 without, with same sex and similar age, were also identified. Through interviews among patients with cancer, 129 reported to have used the sweetener. 255 without reported to have used it. So we're going to look at what is the study design here, calculate the prevalence, as well as the odds ratio. So I'm going to move this up and pull up our 2 by 2 table. Looking at the study design, since patients were categorized based on having cancer versus without, this is a case control study. Next, calculating prevalence, we'll reference our 2 by 2 table where we'll identify our exposure variable. This is the use of artificial sweetener versus our disease status, which is patients with cancer versus without. Looking at the prompt, we know 300 patients diagnosed with bladder cancer were identified. That is our A plus C value. 594 without cancer were identified. That is our B plus D value. Looking at our first column, our A value, 129 reported to have used the sweetener among patients with cancer, whereas 255 without. Knowing this information, we can begin to plug in the rest of the numbers by subtracting, adding, and filling the rest of the table. So in essence, you really just need to be given four values, plugging them into our 2 by 2 table so that we can yield the total number. Now that we have these numbers, we can calculate our prevalence. We were asked to calculate two, the first one of people with cancer. So that's going to take care of that first column, A over A plus C. That's 129 over 300 times 100, 43%. Whereas the prevalence of exposure without cancer, that's B over B plus D, yielding 75%. From here, we can calculate our odds ratio of exposure. Again, the formula is A over C divided by B over D. Mathematically, that equals to AD divided by BC. Plugging in those numbers, this is going to be 129 times 339 divided by 255 times 171. We'll yield some big numbers that we can divide and this is going to yield approximately 1, and I apologize, this is not a percentage. Please ignore that percent sign. Interpreting that 1, we know since the OR is 1, there is no association between exposure and disease, between the use of sweetener and cancer. Next up, we'll go through our measures of central tendency. Three measures here are mean, median, and mode. We'll briefly define. Our mean is our average point within a data set, whereas our median is the midpoint that separates the higher half from our lower half of data, and the mode is the most occurring data point. From here, we can talk about measures of variability, another set of three, our range, standard deviation, and variance. The range is defined as your highest point versus your lowest point within a data set. Oftentimes, this is also referred to as your interquartile ranges. 
so being at the 25th percentile or 75th percentile of the data set, where a standard deviation is the variability around the mean and your variance is just your standard deviation squared. Now that we have a good solid review of all of these definitions, I'm going to pull up a picture that will help us visualize data sets. The most popular way of doing so is within a bell curve. Typically, the top of the curve represents the mean, mode, or median of the data collected. The standard deviation and variance depicts the curve relative width around and distance from the mean. So this is an example of a normal distribution, looks like a curve. With a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all equal. Additionally, the curve follows the empirical rule known as the 68%, 95%, 99.7% rule, which states that 68% of data points are in one standard deviation of the mean, 95 within plus or minus 2, and 99.7 within plus or minus 3 standard deviation of the mean. And with that said, there are some non-normal distributions as well that exhibit either positive or negative skewness resulting in asymmetry of the distribution or of the bell curve. And I'll pull up two examples here on the side. The image on our left, this is an example of a negatively skewed case where the asymmetry is a longer tail on the left side of the curve and typically the inequality states that the mean is less than the median, less than the mode. Whereas the image on the right is an example of a positively skewed graph where the tail is longer on the right side. Quick mnemonic here, the right way to be in life is to be positive. And inequality here is that your mean is greater than the median, greater than the mode. From here, let's go through an example of one more additional epi measure that is a rate, so it's an example of a measure of frequency, in which there's an outbreak. 18 people in 18 different households become ill. The population at hand is comprised of 1,000 people. What is the attack rate? So this is going to be the number of people affected divided by the number of people in that population. Here, this is 18 divided by 1,000. We can times it by 100 to yield a percentage. This is going to be 1.8% attack rate. This is in contrast to our secondary attack rate, number two. One incubation period later, 17 persons in the same households as the primary cases, this is important, then develop shigellosis. If the 18 households included 86 persons, what is the secondary attack rate? So number two here, our secondary attack rate, same numerator, number of people ill, different denominator this time, we want to subtract these primary cases. So our numerator, number of people ill, 17 persons, divided by our 86 persons, which was given as total, minus the initial 18 primary cases, times 100 yields a 25% secondary attack rate. On to our next slide on data analysis, where we can apply all of these measures that we've just used. Given a data set, it is possible to make and test hypotheses in order to prove a statement about the general population using only data collected from a sample. So that's what this picture represents, our big population and our small sample that we take to conduct research. Three steps we'll go through. Number one, you make the hypothesis. Number two, you use a statistical test. And number three, you make an inference on these. So going through number one and two, with hypothesis generation, there are two hypotheses to define, one being your null, two being your alternative. A null hypothesis states there is no relationship between disease and risk factor, whereas the alternative hypothesis states there is a relationship. Very important to note that you can either reject or not reject these hypotheses, but you can never ever accept 
And to test these hypotheses, we have four different statistical tests that we'll go through briefly here. The first two, your Z tests and T tests, are similar in that they both are used to compare two means. Your third, your ANOVA, also known as analysis of variance, this is used to compare three or more means. Whereas your fourth one, your chi-square, this is used to compare two or more percentages and or proportions. An example of this is your blood pressure readings, which are not means. Altogether, these statistical tests will always yield a p-value or probability value that we'll discuss on this next slide compare and contrast to what is an alpha level and types of error within research studies in EPI. So starting with our p-value, this is going to help us determine whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. In order to determine this, we need to first define our alpha level. This is the statistical significance level value provided by the problem, and if not always stated or given, then always assume that the significance level is set at 0.05, whereas your p-value is going to be compared to the significance level. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, you do not reject the null. Remember, never accept, you just do not reject the null hypothesis. If it is less than 0.05, then you do reject the null hypothesis, meaning there is a relationship between disease and exposure. Remember, the smaller the p-value, the more likely it is that an actual association exists not due to chance and or error. And with that said, we'll go through and talk about the different types of error that do exist. Type 1 incorrectly rejects your null hypothesis, whereas your type 2 is going to incorrectly fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is very important to note here, as your type 2 error is going to generally be referring to false negatives, whereas type 1 error is generally referred to false positives. Note that the probability of making a type 1 error is equivalent to the significance level or alpha. And the reason we document error is because it's important to reduce bias within a study, one such type being confounding, which is usually found post-study, which is at this stage, the data analysis stage. And with that said, I'm going to pull up a table here that kind of summarizes everything we've just talked about where at the top we have the two columns of our hypothesis generation and on the side we have the two rows with our decision to reject or fail to reject the null. Lastly, in addition to hypothesis testing, confidence intervals may be formed to determine a range of values within which the true mean value of the population is expected to fall along with a specified probability. The CI is determined using the sample mean, where Z is determined by the confidence level. For the 95% CI, the Z value is 1.96. For the 99, it's 2.58. Three conclusions to be made here. If the CI difference between two means is zero, then there is no statistical significance that exists. If the CI of relative risk or odds ratio is 1, then there is also no statistical significance that exists. And lastly, if the CI of two groups overlap, then there is no statistical significance that exists. And with that said, our next slide is a summary of everything that was just discussed. Please subscribe below, like and share. For additional practice problems, please check out the Public Health Epidemiology textbook with the link in the description to this video.